so, uh, Jordan Castile received a BA from Agnes Scott College and an MFA in painting and printmaking from Yale. She has participated in recent exhibitions at Casey Kaplan Gallery, Crystal Bridges Museum, the Studio Museum of Harlem, and Mass Mocha. And she has an upcoming solo show at the Denver Art Museum. Um, she's been an artist in residence at Yaddo, the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council, the Studio Museum in Harlem, and the Sharp Lenses Studio Program. And her work has been featured in Art Forum, The New York Times, Flash Art, Interview, The New Yorker, Elle Magazine, Vogue, Freeze, and a bunch of other places too. Um, and I'm very happy to introduce Jordan Castillo. Yeah. Um, so, what's amazing about what Jonathan just did is my first slide is kind of irrelevant, but you get pictures to go along with that wonderful introduction because um, I, first of all, I'm excited to be here, but I was born and raised in Denver, Colorado. Um, so this is the beautiful Colorado landscape. My high school was like right over, I used to run around this lake for field hockey. <laughs> I play field hockey. Anyway, that was the thing. Um, so, and then I have two brothers. So my twin brother is Miles. He's right here. Um, and his son, Josiah. And then my older brother and his wife and his two kids. They're very important to me. And then these are my parents and cheesing on either side of me as I was graduating from the Yale School of Art, which we all thought would never happen. Um, and then this is a flag from Studio Museum. So, yeah. This is just like some visuals to that context. It's really important um, that people have a sense of like who I am um, and, and thinking about the work because I think all of it is stemming from my experiences in my life uh, in Colorado with my brothers, with my family, my friends, what have you. Um, so there are things that I'm sure you guys are sort of already aware of. Uh, and then as I talk, like I'm just gonna rush through this, quite frankly, because I really would love to have questions more than anything. I don't want to be like a, um, a repetitive horse or something. So I'm really interested in the broader scope of the human experience. There was a question just now outside about me painting black men. Um, and I like to think of it as more an expansive sense of humanity. Um, and even when I, I'll, we'll look at the nudes, that when I was doing those nudes, I was always curious that people would um, impose the black male narrative on these bodies that really um, were more ambiguous than that in terms of the genitalia, that there could be more fluidity in what, um, how gender was addressed. So Visible Man was the first show that I had um, coming out of grad school. I was super lucky because I got this random email and they weren't entirely crazy. You know, when you start getting emails from galleries or whatever, and you're like, I don't know who these people are. I've never done this before. Um, and I just said yes because I didn't know any better. And it worked out in um, many ways because I ultimately did two shows with them. But the first show that I did with them, Visible Man, was related to my thesis exhibition at Yale, where, as I said, I was starting to address um, the black male body and humanity. And I was really interested in vulnerability, specifically, thinking about how do I represent those that I love most um, in such a way that people can see them as I've always seen them or known them. So um, I'm also, I'm gonna play this little video. Um, so this was a video that was made in um, conjunction with that exhibition that I think is pretty relevant to like all the things I'm talking about, worth listening to. It was right when the Trayvon Martin acquittal had happened when I was in Gloucester, Massachusetts. And it became very clear to me then that I needed to make a body of work that had the voice that I felt like um, was necessary for the times. And it was a call that I had gotten from my twin brother right after that happened. And we were both very emotional, where I couldn't help but think that it could have been him. And um, that I felt that I needed to make something more um, visible again that um, I felt like wasn't being seen. So I returned. Um, to my studio and immediately started on this body of work where I initially had photographed my twin brother's best friend um, in Denver, Colorado and brought that photograph back to my studio. I'd done this painting of him clothed and realized quickly that the clothing actually became more of a shield than I wanted. Um, the conversations I was having around that piece were one where people were blocked by what he was wearing as opposed to really seeing him for who he was. 
I was really afraid of two things happening, either hypersexualizing or villainizing the black man in a way that I think is already happening in the world. And I didn't want to contribute to that. So to take off their clothes was terrifying to me. I did not want, if you just Google black men, you come up with images that are very sexualized. It's like unbelievable and overwhelming in a lot of sense. So I um, said I would give it a shot either way and that I would try to make choices in the paintings where it could not, where sexuality wouldn't be inherent. I felt like people were more interested in the stories behind their eyes and the gaze um, and where they were and what they were doing and who were these men became the, kind of the question that people were asking, not what are they wearing. I brought it to the domestic space because I felt it was really important to capture who these men were in their most comfortable and intimate and vulnerable spaces. I would ask questions like, is there anything in the room that you really want to be a part of this part, this painting? Um, and if so, like, tell me where, or if there's a part of the room. It was very collaborative. I wanted it to be collaborative. It wasn't directive on my part. It was, how do you want to be represented? There was choice. And that, I think, gives somebody the ability to have their own story be on the front. Otherwise, it would be my story of them that I want to tell. Their stories have to be a part of this, too. I hope that these men are seen, and that there's an understanding that humanity does not necessarily mean that we have the ability to take life in the same way that people think that they can give it. You know, that I, these lives are important, and they're just as important as the person sitting next to you and the people that you love. Now, these paintings are not an answer to a problem that I think is really much too great um, for me to do alone, that it's really about conversations that happen amongst people and um, us sharing with one another. So my hope is that these paintings continue to be shared um, and talked about, and that once they're seen, that when you go back and talk to your friends and say, hey, I just saw these paintings today, or whether the people who own the paintings now can say, yeah, I bought this painting, this is what it means to me, what do you see? Um, that dialogue begins to happen, and that dialogue, I think, is the beginning of change. Yes, for a little segment. Anyway, um, so what's kind of interesting for me watching that back is that it really does hit on um, my desire to represent my community. And at this time, I was photographing and painting mainly people from the School of Drama. So I went to the law school at Yale because I had a few friends who were in the law school and was like, hey, I'm looking for some black men to pose for these paintings. And they were like, hell no, nah, get out of here. There's no way we're doing this. We're gonna be like judges in the future. Like I don't need new pictures of me out there. Then I went to the business school. They similarly were like, we want nothing to do with you. And then somebody was like, you should just go to the drama school. I was just there last week and they're getting like naked on stage all the time. And I was like, that's brilliant. Um, so I sent an email to one friend of mine who was in the drama school asking Asking, me, asking her if she could connect me to the black male actors in the program. And I sent this email that explained my project, was like, hi, I'm an artist at the School of Art, and um, I'm trying to do this thing around black men. And because my name is Jordan, a lot of them assumed that I was a man. And so I had this weird moment kind of continually happen where first, none of them like responded. Um, one did, and Jure, actually, let me see. Uh, this young man, Jure, who's become one of my dearest friends, actually. Uh, and he was like, yeah, I'd love to do this, like, whatever. And so I was sitting on the steps. We decided we were going to meet on the steps of the School of Art, and he walked right past me, and I was like, Jure. And he was like, yeah, can I help you? And I was like, I'm Jordan, I'm the one painting. He was like, oh, my God, I definitely thought you were a man, but okay, cool. Um, but I think that that has been, especially in the early phases of my career, was... Um, a significant part of this work for me is that people's assumptions that this work could only be made by a man. We were also just having a conversation about the art world being dominated by male narratives. Um, and particularly, I think the representation of a male body, people would assume would be done more, it would be more feasible for a man to paint this in their minds than it is for like this young black woman sitting on the steps at Yale. So um, what was great about Dre saying yes is it meant that like he started a trend, like people saw the painting and it was like he gave me the cred I needed with everyone else because then everybody started reaching out and saying that they wanted to participate too, that they wanted their portraits done. Um, all of them were in their homes. The only person who wasn't in their like apartment at Yale was Dre because he literally had no furniture. Uh, we went to his house and like literally like there was nothing and I photographed him on the floor but it just felt 
I was really interested in domesticity um, and having absolutely nothing was a little bit of a challenge. So a friend of mine who had this like glorious couch was like, you can shoot them on my couch. So we went to her place. Um, I think what's also important about this painting and you'll see is like I moved through my practice is this was the first time that I started leaving these like drawings, these like unfinished parts of the painting. So leaving that plant that was like leaned over in this like sketchy form um, in relationship to all the plants beneath and the like paisley being so deeply painted. And then that's Atu next to him um, and that's in his home and that's a portrait of his mother next to him. So I mentioned in the video that my process is one in which I say like, where do you want to be? Like when you knew I was coming, where did you envision yourself? Was kind of like my first question. Um, and generally people had spent time envisioning themselves somewhere. I guess all of us would if somebody said they were gonna come to their portrait in their home is like, I've always thought of myself as occupying this couch as a throne, like whatever. Um, so he had chosen this chair and this portrait of his mom. It was really important for him to have that in it as well. So um, the collaboration aspect of this work is really important to me and asking what's important to you is something that I want to be sure to uh, translate into the painting. Uh, Devin is, is and was one of my classmates at Yale um, in the School of Art and he was obsessed with this elephant that's like beneath him. Um, when I asked what he wanted in the painting, that elephant was the thing that he chose. And now I can't remember the elephant's name. It's pretty fabulous, the name of it. Now I can't think of it. But I was looking at a lot of David Hockney paintings. So I was really influenced by those and did that elephant in this like really weird um, textural way. I was trying to figure out how do I push my color? I had that conversation with several of you in your studios today. Um, and the best way for me at the time to like push my color was to look at other people's color. So like looking at paintings that I really admired in the world and then using that painting as the palette choice for my painting, um, allowing it to inspire the, the colors that the painting would hold. Um, the color, it was also important for me at the time that uh, the figures, the play on what a person of color looks like could be fluid too as a fair-skinned black woman um, who actually I'm not biracial but I'm often perceived as biracial and I have a twin brother who's significantly darker than I am and I have an older brother who's significantly lighter than I am that most black families or families of color I would say if you pulled out our family albums there is real um, there's a real breadth of what a person of color and what our communities look like. And so as I was always thinking about that, I wanted these paintings to be a representation of that. I, Jerry Saltz just like showed up in the studios one day and my door happened to be open and he just like bombarded in. Uh, and I happened to have the painting of Dre up. I was like working on it. And he came in and like started giving me this like off the cuff critique that I did not necessarily ask of him, but I was like, I can't believe Jerry Saltz is in here. So like, I'm gonna go with this. Um, and he was like, oh, okay, well you're a painter and you're painting black men and hold on, wait, he's actually green. That's interesting. Like, I'm really interested in the fact that I said he was a black man before I actually took the time to realize he was green. And like hearing him externalize his experience of the painting really solidified for me some of that, the choices that I was making around color in the body. Um, so I just kind of kept pushing that. I think these early paintings in particular um, were more fearless in being as far from the spectrum of natural skin tone as possible, like Dre, uh, as Devin being purple. Um, this one too, like the tra there's a Trayvon Martin painting behind him that a lot of people, the woman who bought this painting actually didn't realize that that was back there until sort of recently because she sent me this email and I was like, what, what were you looking at? Um, because it almost looks as if it's coming out of his mouth and that was important to me. It was a painting that a friend of his had done like I said in the video, Trayvon, that particular instance um, helped spearhead this project. So it felt like a, a reconnection for me. Um, Cornelius, we went into his uh, house and it was so filthy. I could not like, he was like, oh, where do we go? And finally I was like, just sit in the pile of clothes because I don't know where else to go. Like there were so many clothes and things that were like nondescript. Uh, he had type one diabetes and he had, um, 
what's it called, where the insulin pump. So there were like needle, at the time I didn't know all this. There was like stuff around that kind of made me nervous because I didn't necessarily like know him, know him. Um, but I wanted to articulate that experience of being in his face. And as a result, like the painting kind of got stuff in it. And there's some, like this little green thing, people were always like, what is that? And I was like, I'm just trying to make you feel what I felt going in his face. Like, I don't know, actually. Um, these are install shots of the exhibition at Yale, uh, or not at Yale, at Sergeant's Daughters. So after the nudes, the visible man happened, I, um, I got into Studio Museum, which I thought could never happen. Um, similar to getting into Yale, I thought could never happen. I am lucky in the sense that my mother has always been one to push me outside of my comfort zone, and she believes in me more than I often believe in myself. Whatever that person is in your life, it's always like nice to recognize them because oftentimes they get you to do things you might not have ever done otherwise. And I never saw my, myself or my work valuable enough to occupy those spaces that I was aware of a place like the Studio Museum in Harlem um, in the context that I was like aware of Kahende Wiley, you know, like I, I, I knew it was important to the black community. I knew it was important to Harlem. I knew that it had a history that I would of course love to be a part of, but never thought that contemporarily I could be. So I got into studio museum and I had already committed to doing a second show with Sergeant's Daughters. I, um, made a lot of these paintings on Governor's Islands. I had another residency at the time, like survival of the fittest in New York, trying to find space to paint is like real. So I was de definitely residency hopping hardcore to find time and space to make work and would go to great lengths to just have space. So Governor's Island was one of the residencies I did, which was crazy, but also kind of great. Um, I'm just gonna play a piece of this video. It's by the same people about this show specifically. In my world, black men have been such a prominent part of who I am. It's my father, it's my brother, it's my cousins, it's the people I love, those are my closest friends. Black men have been everything for me for as long as I can remember. I have a twin brother, I have an older brother. Those relationships have been super important to me. And as a result, I, the first painting that I did in this body of work was my twin. As twins, paternal twins, and male-female relationship, I always felt like there was something different happening in my brother's life than my own. Um, and I was looking to understand that further. This work is much more, as you said, intimate. It's personalized. These paintings are about vulnerability in the same way that Visible Man is about vulnerability. But as you said, the intimacy is what changes these. Um, and my own personal connection and love for these people. Getting access to that intimate space, the connection between one another, um, is everything for all the work I've been made, making for the past two years. It's like, how do you begin to allow people to enter a space and feel what I feel when I'm connected to these people and they're connected to one another? What does it mean for someone to see who you are in all of your entirety as a human being, all those levels, as a vulnerable man, as a loving man, as a father, as a brother, as a cousin, as a parent? What does that mean in relation to one another? And somebody last night actually at the opening mentioned that all of them are touching. And I thought that was a very poignant observation that they were making. It was all of them are connected physically and emotionally in these paintings. It is about changing imagery. Imagery is everything, right? And what we are inundated with all day, every day, are mass media images of the black man as the villain, the black man as the thug, the black man. We could go on and on on the stereotypes. And each of those stereotypes and each of those visions of the black man is exactly what I'm trying to counteract here because those have never been the truth. The truths I've known for the men who have been in my life. None of them are thugs. None of them are, like, literally, they are the people that I love and are loved. These are people who are part of a community, and the only way that they're gonna to begin to be seen on a greater context of who they are and what they have to offer is by literally bringing people into the intimate space. If I can welcome anyone, whether it's someone who's outside of the black community um, into that, I think that's how we begin to change the dialogue, and we're in great need of that right now, more than ever. I um, so this, Project. Oh, 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 that's sorry. I guess I had to double slide. Um, <laughs> this project in particular was 
um, spearheaded by the fact that somebody had seen all the nudes and made a reference that they felt like they were surrogates for my twin brother, that they had heard me talk about that relationship enough to recognize that um, I might have been avoiding that which has been driving this whole practice all along, which was an investigation of that relationship and a desire to share um, the complexity of humanity in general, and particularly the humanity of a black man that I loved and knew uh, before I was even born kind of thing that I literally kind of shared space with. So this isn't the painting of him. When I get to it, I, I'll show you or point it out. But um, so I did a painting of him right after I finished the nudes and I had had that conversation. I had been thinking about it a lot. I finally decided I'm going to address this head on and paint my brother. And I was in Denver for Christmas or some holiday. Um, and I just happened to have my camera on me and I was visiting my brother and I was like, would you mind if I take your photograph like for a painting? And his son was there and his son kept getting in the frame and he was like, yo, just I like, this is just me. And then finally I was like, you know what? This is, I don't know what's happening here, but I'm just gonna go with it. It's one of those moments where as much control as you wanna put on a circumstance, sometimes you just have to let it go and let the world do what it's trying to do. And my nephew was definitely trying to be all up in it with his little stuffed animals, so I'll point that out. But after doing that painting, it meant that I went back to the studio and thought about um, something special that was happening, and that was a relationship between my twin brother and his son. And um, I decided that the next time I went back to Denver that I would use that opportunity to photograph family and friends and brothers and um, men that I had known in my life in Denver and their relationship to one another, do an investigation of the relationships between black men. So this, these are the Crockett brothers. Um, Justin, when I was looking at colleges, like showed me around DC when I was like 16. Um, and he just happened to be home and his brother was there. That was like my first boyfriend and his dad. I literally like showed up in Denver, people I hadn't talked to in years and was like sending out text messages, um, being like, hey, I'm doing this project. Kind of like Yale, like making a call for people to help me. Um, this is my mom's barber and his son, um, Jace, who we couldn't get to wake up to save our lives. Like he was knocked out, kid you not, for like 45 minutes and we were like trying to wake him up. And finally I was like, you know what? Again, another moment where it's like, just put your arm around him. We're just going to go with it because the light looks really amazing and I just got to get out of here. Um, so there were choices I was making in the painting. He has all these like college flags up in the barber shop and I added the Yale one, um, which wasn't actually there, but... I ended up giving it to him later to put on the wall. Um, he also drove me to prom. That's a whole other story. Um, this is one where I didn't, this is the only one, the one on the left is the only one where I didn't know the people specifically, but it was in a barber shop in New Haven. Um, I was sitting waiting for a friend of mine to get their hair cut and took photos of some of the people who were waiting to have their hair done. Um, this is my best friend Sinq and his dad and his son. So that's three lions. Um, these guys, I gave a talk where I just started thinking, like I finished the painting of my brother and I was at Hunter College. And at the end of the talk, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing next, but maybe I'm gonna investigate this thing because this painting with my brother is kind of interesting. And these two brothers came up to me and they were like, we want to be like a part of this. Um, and so they, the Ashmole brothers became a part of it. What was great about that is because they had heard me speak about my work when I showed up to their dorm room, they had like made a diorama of all their favorite things. Like they had purposely placed so many things in their space that I ultimately had to curate like the majority of them out because it was so cluttered. But I had to ask them similarly, like, okay, out of everything that's in here, what's the most important? And they're Nigerian, and the flag in the background was important. And then the drawing, one of them had done a drawing of his other brother, and that was important. So those were the things that kind of, like, stuck around. They also, basketball, they said, was really important. But then this is the one of my twin brother and my nephew, Josiah. Um, so the instance where I'm describing where Rocky is the name of that stuffed animal, made a, an appearance. Um, what I thought was really interesting about this painting in particular, too, is that the mimicking that my nephew's doing of his dad, of my brother, um, my brother was like, had a very pronounced seriousness, and I think Josiah by nature is not like all that serious. He's pensive, but he's more playful than anything else, but he kind of like did this mirroring of his dad in the circumstance that got translated into the painting. So these are the images, again, at Sergeant Daughters. Um, so then 
I was at Studio Museum while that show opens, like I was still a resident there, but part of the residency at Studio Museum includes an exhibition um, where you actually get to participate in your first, like for me it was my first kind of museum exhibition to this scale where um, the other two artists and myself were curated um, into the space. Are these videos like interesting? Should I keep playing these videos as they're coming up? Okay, I don't, just don't want to like bore you guys. My name is Jordan Castile. I'm a 2015-16 artist in residence at the Studio Museum in Harlem. For me, it's always been a balance between um, social justice and my art. It wasn't until grad school that I felt like those things finally came together in a meaningful way. I found my subject matter, the black male. I felt like um, the world didn't necessarily see and know them as I see and know them, um, as my brothers, as my father, as friends, as lovers, whatever they are. I felt like there was an intimacy that I had access to that I felt um, painting might give it a way of giving other people access to. Up until this point, I had been really invested in the domestic space as being the narrative point. And this is the first time that the street has become that space. I live five blocks away, that my five block walk between home and the studio, there were so many things happening and that vibrancy I had to tune into and thus has created this body of work. One of the most beautiful moments in my time here um, was the second Open Studios event where one of the models showed up and he stood in front of his portrait and he was in such awe. He uh, then brought his wife back, started to thank me um, for seeing him as she had always seen him. To me, that is the essence of why I do this work is about that level of engagement. And unfortunately in the art world, there aren't enough opportunities to share in that way because of museums and accessibility and feeling welcomed in those spaces. I think for all people doesn't always happen. Um, but in that moment, he felt welcomed here, he felt seen here. I ran into them on the street literally two days ago and I was like, ah, oh, Jordan, again, it became a, I created a family for myself here in a way that I couldn't have foreseen when I started this project. It was painting, it gives me a way to see people um, and also share myself with them. And that exchange is priceless. And I can only hope that the exchange that we shared and that essence and that beauty and that moment goes to the home or the museum or the gallery that it goes to next. Whatever white walls it gets put on, that somebody is able to feel that truth. So what's crazy watching that, A, I start tearing up every time I think about James, which is what I started doing in that video, um, is that I, some of you saw me show up with this like, Happy Mother's Day bag with like flowers and stuff because I, right before I came here, I was um, with James and Yvonne and I had finally figured out a way, I've been struggling in how to get um, a piece of this, the, um, again, the accessibility part that these paintings don't live in the homes of the people that it's portraying, um, that they are giving me the gift of their time, treasure, um, and love, and all these other things, and finding a way to honor that back and give them a bit of the value, the like monetary value that the painting has in the market, um, has been this like thing that I've been trying to figure out. And I finally figured it out with the gallery and myself to make these like one-off artist-proof prints and. Um, I delivered it to James and Yvonne today as I was like coming here and we had like, they're ridiculous. So this was, I think, um, a project that became more than the other two, um, really important for me because I was at a place in New York having come from Colorado where I was feeling uh, shrouded in the cloud, quite frankly. Like I just, the hustle that is New York was not ingrained in my system and I wasn't transitioning into that very well. Um, and I didn't know where to call home, um, but getting into Studio Museum, I decided similar to like getting into grad school or getting into Yale is like, if you get this opportunity, you go. And I remember feeling like I, I was living in Ridgewood at the time. Somebody I was talking to today was saying they live in Ridgewood. So I was living in Ridgewood, which is very far from Harlem, what I needed to do. Uh, but I decided to move to Harlem and I took over an apartment from a former resident. 
And that move has changed everything for me because I've actually, be, I have found a home, what I consider a home for possibly um, the unforeseeable future and hopefully the unforeseeable future. And it had everything to do with the people that um, allowed me to see them and then saw me in return. Uh, because I think that so often we're moving through life, particularly at this day and age with our headphones in and we're like plowing through spaces and particularly in New York, you're on the train and you're kind of crammed in, you're witnessing stories or like maybe coming up with stories about people's story, like their lives when you're sitting across from them on the train. It's like, I often am saying a, like a narrative of what I think their day was based off of like the way that they're maybe carrying themselves or their body or their bags or whatever. But very rarely do we actually say hi um, and ask those questions. And this project, as an, I, I do consider myself an introvert by nature, and as somebody who wouldn't be by um, generally like comfortable to just like be like, "Hi, I'm Jordan." Like my mom's that person, but I'm like very much not. Um, but this project has forced me to, at least in intentional times, like do practice that and then to demonstrate that to others. So James was the first person that I painted in this body of work. It took me weeks to finally go outside and photograph because it was the first time that I wasn't just like sending emails to friends of friends and like getting basically like preliminarily background checked people or something. You know what I mean? Like already vouched for people. This was the first time where I was just going to be vulnerable myself to the extent that I was just gonna approach people. And when I finally did it, it took me two hours to like finally stop and introduce myself to someone. And James was that person um, who's in this painting and he was sitting in front of Sylvia's restaurant um, and he sells CDs and he's been selling CDs there for like 25 years, but I walked past him and he literally like had this light, I have never, it was like the, the time where it starts to transition into like dust, that light, that like orange glow light. Um, and it was like shining down on him so beautifully. And I remember walking by and being like, I just made a huge mistake. Like literally the skies opened, the heavens were like, here's your subject, you idiot, like do something. Um, and so I walked back and I introduced myself and James has now, I'll show towards the end, there's, he's been painted again. Um, this is Stanley. He was the only one who I didn't stay in contact with specifically, even though I gave him. So I make a point that in all of these exchanges that I'm giving them my contact information that my goal when I was doing this project in particular was I told everyone was to get them on the walls of the museum. That was my intention. That most of them had never been inside of the Studio Museum in Harlem. They recognized it with the red, black, and green flag. Um, but they weren't, and they knew there was art in there, but they never saw that art as really being for and about them. Um, so my intention was to create a bridge between what felt like a very obvious juxtaposition between the people on the street and then this museum context. Um, but Stanley never hit me back and I never saw him again. So I hope one day he'll come back around. Charles, uh, there was an instance where I had started photographing enough in Harlem that people started calling me painter on the street and introducing me to each other. So there was a circumstance where I had photographed Michael and he was like, yo, Jordan, like my, my boy Charles is around the corner. Like, I would love it if you painted him. He would be the perfect subject. And I was rushing off somewhere and I was like, oh, Michael, like I can't right now. He was like, trust me, trust me. And we turned the corner and similar to like seeing James, I was like, you look like a painting. You know what I mean? Like, I, like he had all these furs that he makes in Canada. Well, he kills and makes all his own furs in Canada and then brings them down in the wintertime in Harlem. Um, so we had this interesting conversation. There's Jared who's sitting in front of the studio museum. Um, I just, that was my studio and I looked out and he was like skateboarding and I was like, that kid seems like an interesting person. I'm gonna just go introduce myself. So this is Michael who introduced me to Charles, Glassman Mike. Kite man, he was flying kites in the same kind of courtyard across from the museum. Um, and he was living his best life. Like I knew I had to introduce myself to him because he was like jamming and he had these microphones and he was like talking to people. And part of me was like, this man's either like super crazy and I might like regret going out there or he's just like living his best life and I need that to just like come into my life. And he totally was just like living his best life. Um, and since then he's like, he'll sell or sell and fly kites in the Adam Clayton Powell like auditorium space. And I go and fly with him whenever I can. But his intention is about, we found similarities in our practices in the sense that he's similarly invested in the community and bringing community together through fun and like this playful thing that we all recognize in our childhood. But so these are install shots from the Studio Museum. 
Um, so then Studio Museum ends and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I decide to work with Casey Kaplan Gallery, which was like, you know, a complicated decision in and of itself, which I'm sure your professors and other artist peers that you guys know can talk to you about. But um, I was trying to figure out what it was that the work was going to do. And Falu um, is a young woman who sells hats, or at the time was selling hats across the street from Studio Museum. And she and I became pretty close, just as friends, um, based off of my walk. Again, like just knowing she was part of my community and my day-to-day -day existence in Harlem. And she was like, why don't you ever pay me? And I was like, nah, girl, I'm so sorry. I'm working on this project with men, blah, blah, blah. But if I ever, if something changes, I'll come back, I'll come back. Finally, I went back. And the day that I went back, it was kind of crazy, similar to James and Charles, where like the clouds, the seas parted. Um, her brother comes out of like the darkness, like literally like comes out from behind this like shroud of Burger King. Um, and I was like, oh my God, like again, like a heavenly grace. So he's adorned, he's Senegalese, and he's a spiritual leader in their tribe. And um, he just happened to be in town and he was on his way to the airport and they only see each other once in a blue moon. Like again, it was just like the stars aligned. Um, so I was really honored to be able to uh, represent the two of them together. And the signal she's holding up is for Allah. Um, and yeah, so. I just like made that, still trying to figure out what I was gonna do next. Um, the day that I photographed Charles, this woman chucked her babies in front of the camera and was like, photograph my babies. Um, and I was like, oh, cool, like, are they twins? I think some of you, if you I told this story on R21, but, um, and so I took this one shot. It literally was just like one picture that I just carried with me um, in the studio. And when I was trying to figure out what's next, uh, I just decided to paint them finally. This is Timothy, he's like, sits at the desk at, you know him? He's pretty, he's been a, like a staple at the Studio Museum for many, many years. And he's the person, like the greeter and um, member services when you get there. So he is somebody, there are times that you just wanna honor people who are close to you and he's one of them. I think I'm gonna skip this R21 video because you guys have seen this one, at least a lot of you have. If you haven't, they're all just, on Google or something or YouTube. Um, there are two of them, so I'll play the second one for sure. Um, so then I was, um, had an impending deadline, perfect. And um, with that impending deadline, I knew that uh, I had to figure out what I was gonna do, because you guys like, like thesis show, like I need to make a show for Casey Kaplan. And I made a sheer uh, aesthetic decision about color. I was interested in how color and light would change at night doing these portraits. So this show in particular um, was an investigation of light and color and the subjects are still primarily men, I think. Is there a woman in there? I don't think there's a woman in any of these. Um, but a similar process where I'm walking around introducing myself. Um, and each of them have been really wonderful. This was the first time that I showed, like I said, there are sometimes works, or I said some, I don't know what I've, I've talked a lot, I guess, in the past few hours. Um, but I, there's paintings that are always happening in my studio that I haven't quite figured out how to get into my practice um, in a public sense. And so these crop paintings showed up in the show for the first time. They're kind of subway vignettes um, where I'm just taking creepy cell phone pictures of people's hands most of the time. Um, and telling a story through it. That's Swiss Beats cousin, fun fact, in the middle. He said that that night and I was like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know, like whatever. And then Swiss Beats DM'd me and was like, yo, I heard you painted my cousin. And I was like, what? Like that was real, that's insane. Um, so small world uh, where I introduced myself. This is also the first time that I started doing like these cityscapes. So I think this is quite figurative. Um, for me, it reads very figurative, but is not a literal depiction of a figure. Huh? The two? Oh yeah, right? Totally. With the trash can and even the juxtaposition of, like, I just took this again, just walking around my cell phone, and I remember thinking, like, that's weird. Like these clearly funeral, like, flowers in the trash can. There wasn't a church directly around there in that part of, like, the city that I was standing specifically in Harlem. Um, so I took a shot and then that became a painting. 
I brought uh, prints to them too earlier. Again, this is another like, this is where I say women. Somebody said there were like 37 women in this one. Um, I was giving a tour of the show and they were like, you painted 37 women in fact. I was like, oh really? <laughs> Thank you, I didn't realize. And then these are the kind of shots. So this is the one of James and Yvonne, um, where James reemerged. And Yvonne has become such a staple, his wife, that it's a story that I described that she came in and hugged me and thanked me for seeing him as she had always seen him. Um, she became a very integral part of the relationship that I've had with both of them. And I decided to go back and photograph um, them together at this day. In particular, we were like eating chicken soup on the street for like two hours. Um, it was cold. Uh, so yeah, these are just like whatever. Um, they're not whatever, but like people, Alice Neal came up, somebody said that today, that my work reminded me of Alice Neal. Um, I read a lot. My process in general, I take photos, the photos then become these like drawings so that there's a photo. And then this is like a perfect example of like I do these underpaintings and then the underpaintings begin to be filled in and I work one within one sitting. So that whole head was painted in like a two hour chunk. And then I never go back into the painting. So working wet on wet is really important to me. Um, and the immediacy that that allows, for me, references similarly to if somebody were sitting in front of me and working from life, that it kind of like puts me under the gun, that I don't have too much time to think about it. And I talked to a few of you guys in your studios today, like you're thinking too much that this has to be a painting. Um, that at some point when you start to practice like relinquishing the pressure, uh, that other more organic things happen or intuitive things happen. So we're gonna do questions, but this is like my final slide. Uh, so a lot of you mentioned you already follow me on Instagram. I was joking outside with Jonathan that like Instagram's like the new website for artists. Like um, it's kind of weird how that happens, but uh, Instagram's like my way of communication for the most part. And um, as Jonathan said too, the Denver Art Museum is the next thing. So that's in January of 2019. Um, but yeah, I try to keep my website updated if there are talks or things happening in the city so you can keep an eye out on that. There's nothing really coming up right now. I needed a break, quite frankly. Like all these shows had happened really close to one another. And so this is the first year, 2018 has been the first year that I've like had no major show to prepare for. Um, granted, 20, you know, the beginning of 2019 has a thing, but so I'm chilling right now and trying things out. I'm playing again. But yeah, are there questions? There's time, yeah. Uh, do you remember what your first painting ever was, Mannequins? Like, okay, this is the thing, right? Like, yeah, probably I was like five, right? That was like probably my first painting ever. I was always like crafting or whatever um, and creative, like I would make these paintings on my wall, I think. I, like mom, now my mom's like, I'm glad I let you do that. At the time it was like, what are you doing? Um, but. I think my first kind of like painting where I felt like an artist, like I happened when I was studying abroad in undergrad and I took my first ever like painting, oil painting class. And I think it, it was very romanticized in the sense that I was like on the valley and the, like in Tuscany and Cortona and I'm like overlooking drinking a cappuccino with a paintbrush in one hand and like oil paint in my hair. And I was like, yes, I could do this forever. I'm a painter. That's like, that's the moment that I recall being like, here I am world. And then I came back and was like, oh shit, nobody, like, it's not that easy. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a good question though. Yeah. Um, so it's changed over time. As I said, when I was in grad school, like I couldn't figure out color to save my life. And some of the choices that I was making were in opposition to people's um, critiques in my studio. So like I remember somebody coming in my studio and being like, oh, this painting has way too much white paint in it. Like you need to use less white paint. So the next painting I made was like just white paint. Like I called it my light skin painting because it was like I just painted him with white paint. Um, and then that's become like one of my favorite paintings. But I think what that taught me was like pushing to the extreme was maybe more what I needed to do at that time, was like not just use the white paint as a crutch to highlight, but the other things could happen. Um, so I was using other artists as reference point. Now color aids are like my best friend. So um, 
I was describing at some point today that like phthalo blue would be in every one of my paintings if I let it. Like there are colors that I just like pick up all the time and if I'm mixing like just off my cuff head, it's like the same colors get made because I have sensibilities that are just like ingrained within me. But I'm deeply invested in color and I consider myself a colorist in the fact that I'm like, I really care about color. Everyone wants to talk about, and it's important, talk about the like social impact of my work. Um, but my greatest challenge recently has been getting people to also interrogate the technical and um, yeah, the technical aspects and interests of mine that uh, I think it's easy as a woman of color, young woman of color artist to like impose certain narratives as being the only that um, people, it's what they're familiar with. It's an easy way because they've heard it before. Um, it's maybe harder to address my work in a technical aspect. So colors, I'm trying to push it and color aids have been my way. So I choose all my palettes in advance. There's the photo. You can kind of see like over here where I was like, I chose my entire palette before I made that painting. Um, where I was thinking like these grays were gonna be a skin tone and like this was gonna be this on the side. Like I was thinking really critically about the relationships of color and the color aids, I throw them all on the floor and I just start picking stuff up. And it is an intuitive process, but it, I, I then match the colors to such an extent that new things can happen in the paintings that might not happen otherwise. Yeah. Um, I would say you, you talked about your, you know, grappling with the market and who you're painting and you mentioned where these paintings are going and yeah. what that means and um, can you reflect on that a little bit more? Yeah, um, so I um, grew up in a very like social justice driven family and so uh, being able to think critically about the world and to understand history and the implications of systems and institutions um, on our physical selves, but also on the trajectory of our lives is like being um, very complicated, but important. So I came, I studied sociology and anthropology while I was an undergrad. And um, it was a little bit of a rude awakening for me showing up at Yale because I, it was my first time being exposed to like the competitive art world commercialism, desire, part of things. Like, I never really thought of myself as being commercially driven. That wasn't my intent, per se. My intent was to make work because it felt important to me. Um, but it's been challenging. And uh, like, for example, the Denver Art Museum. This is my first time working with a major institution on a, an exhibition, a solo exhibition. And there's been a lot of push and pull about creating edu like my values and their values and those things coming together, um, that they are using, I, I, in my opinion, in some ways, I am helpful to them in the sense that they can say as a museum that has not been recognized by the community as being all inclusive, um, that I am useful to them as a face of their attempt or their desire for creating inclusiveness within their programming. Um, and I'm really aware of that, and whether they explicitly say it to me or not, I'm aware of that. But as important as it is for them to like showboat me around the city of Denver and be like, yeah, like look at what we're doing, I've been really um, hard pressed on creating educational programming and having the opening not be just like a VIP invite only thing, but there being a, a patron dinner and then there's a celebration. And I'm interested in like the celebration aspect that this, the work begins to connect to those who are being represented. Um, but it is weird because I am now in some aspect commercial. I think I'd be naive to not recognize that the work is starting to function within a value in the market that is no longer accessible to myself. My mom's always joking where she's like, I can't even own a Castile kind of thing. I'm like, girl, you got the whole basement. You've been like storing your retirement down there. I see you um, <laughs> while you playing. Like, I don't know what you're doing with all those paintings down there. Um, but it is, it's a complicated notion, which is also like when I talked about bringing the print to James, like figuring out how um, to have it invested back in a meaningful way, but also recognizing that like living in New York is a struggle and I'm not financially comfortable enough to do the things I really want to do. Hopefully in the next five, 10 years, I could be in a position where I'm like 10% of all my sales go to X, Y, and Z. Like I'd love, that's really important to me. 
Um, and I don't know all the collectors, but being in a place like Casey Kaplan, which is also, uh, I'm the first black woman painter they've ever worked with. I'm highly representational, which is new for their programming. Um, and I have to have conversations. I just have to be willing to have the tough conversations around the work and the commercial aspect. Um, because I need it to sell, because I want it to be seen, and I want it to be valued. Um, but I also need the people to own it to uh, hang it. I'm not interested in it being stored. I want it to actually be in the world. Um, which is also why all their gazes are looking out, too. That that's, for me, a way of me being proactive on my end, that these people and the paintings are active wherever they go, that they cannot be denied in whatever space they're put in. Yeah. Uh, can you talk a little more about your experiences at Studio Museum Art? Yeah. Um, and I guess how it's influenced your work, especially going forward since you've not left. Uh, I don't even know. Like, it's like, where do you begin with Studio Museum It's become my home away from home. Like, I show up there, like, every other day, like, just to, like, get a glass of water so that I can, like, kiki with the security guards in the front. Like, literally, um, I don't think I recognize that the safety that they provided would be so influential for me at that time. That they protected me from the art world in the market in a lot of ways. Um, that people were starting to poke around, like Jordan, Jordan, whatever. And they just like put the walls down and gave me an incubator to really um, go back within myself and figure out what it is that I'm trying to do and say and how I would function in the art world as a whole and um, being proactive and having foresight about all those things. So like, the first time I got stuck in the elevator with Thelma Golden, like literally, like she walked on, in the elevators at Studio Museum, which is why they're tearing down this building and building a new one, is like that building was like falling apart. Because we literally got stuck in the elevator together. And I hadn't like spoken to her yet, but I was like, like, oh shit, like now I'm in the elevator with Thelma Golden, like what do you say? And I was like, hi. And she was like, hey, Jordan. And I remember that, I was like, oh, you know who I am? She was like, of course I do. Like I was part of the selection process. Um, I think having someone like her, even if she wasn't in my studio all the time, or like my relationship with her isn't one where I'd be like, hey girl, let's drink some water. Like I might do that with the security guards, but I would definitely not do that with Thelma. Um, feeling like I have the support that she offers um, really, yeah, gave me a sense of solace that whatever happened next, that there were people who believed in me and my community in particular, the black community, and to be a part of a narrative of artists who I had grown up looking at, which were, I didn't, I hadn't heard of most contemporary white artists until I got to Yale. I only knew like Jacob Lawrence, Micheline Thomas, uh, Charles White, Hale Woodruff, like there were, there was a, what was on my walls in poster form that I knew, you know? Like, that's all that I knew. Um, so yeah, I think it just, suddenly I became a part of a collection of artists who had recognized that that space was created for them. And it was created to um, historicize, like histor historicize, that might be is a word I just made up. Uh, that they're taking care of the work. Like why artists want their work in museums is because they're taking care of it for a lifetime. You know, that they're, there's systems in place to protect the work and keep it a part of a long-term narrative and a historical narrative. And Studio Museum created that for black artists who didn't have space before that. And it's amazing to me that they continue to do that in many ways, um, that they support and nurture all of us. It was unbelievable. I definitely, and I applied four times. Like it's like, I, it's one of those things that you just, do. And I'm having also sat on the admissions committee at the Studio Museum in, as I was like finishing my residency, I was invited to be a part of the committee. It became really clear to me for the first time that applying to everything should always happen. Because not, even if you're not selected in that moment, there are curators in the room who are looking at your work and talking about your work who might not otherwise. It's so like, why not apply? What's the worst that can happen? You have somebody talk about your work who wouldn't have talked about it before? Like, that's not that bad. You know what I mean? And then from that, who knows what relationships that those people then put you in their back pocket and maybe when they're curating something else somewhere else, then they pull you out of it. Um, it just became, I became really aware of how the systems of the art world kind of function uh, it's through Studio Museum. I'm a walking billboard for Studio Museum. They know it too, because they, they, they call me often. Yeah. Being a multi-hyphenate, coming out of like a social justice family, yeah. and then going to school and doing anthropology and sociology, and just having all of these professions 
in your hand mm -hmm. and then coming to this place mm -hmm. what what was it because I, I know you're doing painting yeah but what was it that you feel that kind of brings all of those things that you are professional at into one thing was it the subject was it the studio museum was it the historical context of yeah. the community like what was it that you feel that brings everything for you in your career as a professional like multi hyphenate obviously um to kind of this full rainbow of like um a person work and you know just kind of bringing it all together what's that linchpin that brings it all together for you? uh i wish there was a linchpin i don't think there is a linchpin mainly because i think that it's all these little microcosms of experiences that have helped to shape me as the artist that I am now. Like I think, so in elementary school, I went to this all white like Montessori school where we like didn't have uh, grades and we had to make agendas and we had to like be self monitored and like we were, so had to be self-sufficient. Like it was time management was like the preface of that programming. And I hated it there. I was kind of like, for many reasons, but one of the things I gained from that in first grade was like the ability to manage my time. As an artist, thank God for that, because there are times that I look at my peers and I'm like, what you doing? And my gallery like loves and hates me because I'm so organized, like I have calendars and checklists everywhere where I'm already thinking about how and when I'm gonna make the paintings for X, Y, and Z exhibitions through 2019. Um, and that's a skill that I gained then, which I think has directly affected my ability to be a self-sustaining uh, artist, right? Uh, I think that my family, um, I come, my mom's the director and CEO of the Women's Foundation in Colorado and has worked in philanthropy my entire life and been the head of several community foundations. So I grew up um, very community based that my mom in the summertime was like, oh, you don't have nothing to do? Well, you better go volunteer down the block because X, Y, and Z organization needs their, like I know that they need help. So I would spend my summers with arts organizations, like nonprofit arts organizations in the community, uh, working with kids and I always saw value in that and importance of that. Um, then going to, to um, Agnes Scott, I came to New York and I looked at art schools for BFAs. I was like, yeah, I'm gonna be an artist. And I got here and was like, oh, hell no, New York is like real stressful. Um, I need a campus. And I don't understand this art school thing. Like that scared me because I felt like it was, it had a air about it that didn't feel right for me um, and competitive or whatever. And I figured if I could write, I could do anything. That was like my thinking at the time. I got a liberal arts degree because I was like, if I can write and be a critical thinker in the world, then I can figure the rest of the shit out, whatever the world brings next, you know what I mean? Um, and I think that's been true, that my ability to write artist statements, my ability to apply for jobs outside of the arts because I needed to like pay my rent to live in New York came from my confidence in being able to um, do many other things. And I've had a lot of modeling of that, and at some point you think, well, these things are gonna be lost once I become an artist. And the reality is, is I think a lot of my success at this point has come from all these little things that I've learned up until this point. And a lot of them are based in self-sufficiency, self-drive, uh, falling on my ass a lot. Like it sounds like my trajectory is like, the sky's opened and got, brought me James all the time. Um, but that hasn't been the case. Like getting to Yale was miserable for me and really hard um, because I didn't have formal art training. Uh, but I think falling on my butt, I've had health stuff. Like the, life has prepared me to like know that life will continue to happen. And because I know life will continue to happen and be unexpected, I will control what I can, which is why I have all my checklists. I'm very controlling. Um, and I, I, I also recognize I'm controlling to allow room for error. Like, I plan four weeks for a painting because I know it's possible that five days out of those four weeks, I'm not going to feel well. But it might be great. I might be chilling. Like, I might feel fine. And I need to take care of my mental and physical health more first and foremost. Um, so, yeah, I don't think there is a linchpin, per se, in my how I feel like these things have come together for me. I think it's literally just, like, when you start seeing your soul's code or something. That's what my mom calls it. Like seeing that which in, has always been with us, within us, but we have doubted for many years and then just allowing it to happen. Um, but now I, I just feel more trust in allowing it to happen, even if there's failure involved. 
Uh, Sarah Lewis wrote this great book. Now I can't think of the title of it, but it's about failure and the arts and um, the, the benefits of failure, you know, perceived failures. I told several of you in your studio to like, just like make a bad painting, like stop thinking about it, you know? Like it's like, whatever you're so afraid of, it ultimately won't be that scary in, scary in the end because it's just gonna open up more opportunities you didn't realize before. You're probably, like if you fall in front of the building, you're not gonna walk that way anymore. Lesson learned, you know what I'm saying? Like that hurt, got it, but now I'm gonna walk the other way and that when I walked that way, I saw a whole bunch of flowers that I didn't know were there before. You know what I mean? Like literally, you just don't know. Yeah. Um, talked about um, taking photographs to show the prints of photos, mm -hmm. and we see the uh, right. So the the step between this print uh -huh. and uh, the canvas, are you projecting or no? No, uh, I'm bringing it in. Um, which is also sort of crazy because while I was at Yale, it was like you can't draw because I I never took a drawing class. Even though I like painted on the hills in Italy, like it was a very, it wasn't really like a formal class. It was kind of like paint this fennel. And I was just like painting fennel. Um, so I never was like taught how to draw formally where I went into Yale and all my classmates like had been trained at Micah and Cooper or whatever and like drew, drew, you know, like in a way that you think of like drawing books. Um, and what I have now seen to be an asset that they saw as a failure during most of my Chris Eats was that I didn't have to unlearn the thing that I had been so caught up in learning. You know, like I, the things that were flaws, the like wonkiness of my drawing was actually an asset. And I could find ways of tying, like tightening it up and growing within that, but it's all freehanded. And I'll do the freehand, the sketch will happen in maybe two hours, and then it's just like I'm making decisions on composition. It's not. A, like you can kind of see I have stacks of photos in each of those because it's not like one to one always between photo and painting. That I'll take 100 photos sitting with somebody in that instant and I'm like clicking in different ways and I'm like catching the thing far off to their right or whatever and I'll sometimes condense or change the composition. They're all things that actually exist for the most part but sometimes I'm making choices compositionally that are from other things. And that comes from the drawing part. Like, I'm just like moving stuff around, figuring out the composition. Yeah. Yeah. Are you painted your mom ever? Yes. Um, I painted her while I was in uh, grad school at Yale. She sat for me once. And it's actually been this great dispute because I'm trying. Anyway, the art world is shitty sometimes, and people take advantage of things. Um, and I'm trying to get that painting back right now because um, somebody's trying to like flip it. And it's one of the few kind of out there, yeah. But I also did this like crop painting, um, which is maybe on my website, but maybe not, just of her hands. That was one of those ones that I just kind of like did on the side that was sitting in my studio for a long time. Uh, my mom, maybe obviously, so my mom and I are pretty close. Um, so I feel like she's manifested in a lot of these paintings, but that's a good point. No, I haven't painted her though recently. I got my twin. I haven't got my older brother yet, and that's been a point of contention. He's like, what's good? Like, I, uh, but he lives in Arizona. It's not so easy. <laughs> and it's really important to me in my process that I take the photographs, that I'm physically present for that exchange. Um, because he's been like, I'll take photos of uh, whatever. And I'm like, no. Or even my, my partner, my boyfriend's a photographer, and he'll be like, oh, you know, you need a better camera. I'm not, I'm not, I don't consider myself a photographer. But the photos are getting better, just like anything does with time. You know, like there are times I'm like, shoot, that's a dope photograph. Like, like this, like there are times that I'm like, yeah, nailed it, you know. Um, but I don't think I would want them like, uh -oh. Is there anything else? I think we're near the end. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. <laughs>